record right now. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation of Morning in the Morning. I'm Brandon Fess with the Local History and Genealogy Division at the Rochester Public Library. Today we have a presentation called Carved in Stone, exploring cemetery symbolism and iconography. Cemeteries are an incredible collection of symbols and icons, images used to represent and tell us about people's lives, beliefs, ideas that are preserved forever in stone. Our speaker today is Deb Coffey, who's a trustee and volunteer coordinator for the Friends of Mount Hope Cemetery. She's a historian, researcher, and cemetery enthusiast, a current trustee, tour guide, and volunteer coordinator with the Friends of Mount Hope Cemetery, and an aspiring Gettysburg licensed battlefield guide. Deb has explored and photographed several cemeteries in researching 19th century funerary art and architecture, cemetery symbolism, and Civil War history. Retired from the corporate world, she currently works in public safety. Without further ado, Deb Coffey. Good morning, everyone. And Brandon, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Welcome to Carved in Stone, exploring cemetery symbolism and iconography. I apologize, I seem to be having a technical difficulty on my end. I apologize for that glitch. So we'll get started. Symbols are a part of our daily lives. We use, respond and react to them without much thought. Think of all the traffic signals and symbols that you encounter while driving your car that directional arrow that tells you which way to go, or that red octagonal sign that instructs you to stop. How many times have you replied to that text message by just using a smiley face or a thumbs up? Symbols communicate with us subconsciously and can be a substitute for written words. Perhaps that's why companies and corporations rely so heavily on symbols and logos in their marketing and branding campaigns. Seeing their symbols triggers a reaction and a response to their products and services. But what do symbols have to do with cemeteries? A cemetery is a virtual encyclopedia of symbols. They are everywhere, on headstones, monuments, mausoleums, chapels, stained glass windows, and statuary. But why are they there? What do they mean? And what can we learn from them? So in this particular slide, there's examples of classic architecture in that of the Dunn mausoleum, the stained glass window of that particular mausoleum that now resides at the Memorial Art Gallery Louder. in Rochester. The wreath, symbolic of victory. The tree stone monument, are ones that are extremely popular and some that are the most photographed in the cemetery. And then finally, some that have thought that perhaps a person was wealthy because of the, what seems and appears to be a dollar sign or a money sign is really the letters IHS the three letters of the word Jesus from the Greek alphabet. The topic of cemetery symbolism is enormous and just one example can send you researching in 10 different directions. There are over 8 
thousand examples of religious and secular symbols in cemeteries. Additionally, there are hundreds of emblems for particular social and service clubs and organization. So there's a lot of different things out there to look at. Since it would be impossible to highlight them all just within the parameters of this presentation, I've chosen a representative sample that I'm sure that you'll find uh, interesting. Some will probably be familiar to you, but hopefully there'll be a few that will be brand new. But before we get started, just a few caveats. Symbols are known to have multiple meanings and gravestone scholars have debated the interpretations and the origins of some symbols for decades. My goal today is to inspire you to rediscover the art, beauty, and symbolism that, are, that is found in cemeteries. And finally, some headstones have absolutely no symbolism at all. The use of symbols is purely a personal and family decision, but it's likely influenced by last wishes, values, and the religious beliefs of the deceased. Cemeteries are a reflection of the cultural values of the society at large. If something was popular or stylish or commonly accepted, chances are it found its way into the cemetery of the time. Cemeteries became the repositories of art, architectural styles, and accepted symbols. Analyzing that symbolism helps us to understand those who came before us as it gives us perspective and allows us to consider people in their historical context. So what does a headstone tell us? For the most part, basic vital statistics. Typically we'll find a name, a birth date, a death date, sometimes a person's age, as appears on this particular headstone, right down to the year, how many days, uh, how many months and how many days that person was in age. Sometimes we can discover marital and family relationships, a person's religion, their place of birth, their occupation, social member, and generally, their thoughts and beliefs in the afterlife and how they wanted to be remembered. So where were people buried? What were the different types of cemeteries? What did people do and how did people bury their dead in America? So if we go back in time, we have the Native American burial mounds and sacred grounds. People were buried in churches and churchyards. There were always the family burial grounds, which was usually family owned land. The city and public burying grounds sometimes referred to as boneyards. There was the garden rural cemeteries and later in time, lawn parks and memorial parks. And then of course, there are specialty cemeteries, including military and private organization, professional and those of fraternal groups. Visual, visual symbols and headstones have been in existence for as long as people have been mourning, burying, and memorializing their dead. Even though the materials used for headstones varied from slate to natural stone, wood, sandstone, limestone, white bronze, 
marble and granite. The purpose for the carved symbols remained fairly consistent. The symbols were meant to convey messages to the observer about the deceased. Visitors to 17th and early 18th century cemeteries and burial grounds encountered a slew of symbols and warnings meant to remind people of impending death. Doom and damnation were typically represented by skulls, skeletons, death heads, coffins, and hourglasses. And you can see some of that symbolism represented in these two pictures. It was a clear indication that people were obsessed with mortality and the fear of dying. The outlook was quite grim. People would live, die, and rot. After the Great Awakening, Americans began to shift away from the Puritan and Calvinist beliefs about death. The 19th century would usher in changing religious and spiritual attitudes that made death a celebrated event. The idea of impending doom was replaced by a more romantic and gentle approach to death. The Grim Reaper was replaced by winged cherubs in optimistic symbols of love and hope. Sin and damnation gave way to forgiveness and redemption. This shift in attitude led to the belief that the soul would experience a rebirth and that death was the gateway to everlasting life. Ars Moriendi, the art of dying, takes center stage in the lives of Victorian Americans. People would strive to achieve what they called the good death and they practice precise mourning rituals and customs. This new approach to death and dying was reflected in the art, literature, music, clothing, jewelry, and keepsakes of the day. The deceased were seen as just sleeping until the time that they would be reunited with their loved ones. Sometimes headstones included an inscription or epitaph. The carved words serve to memorialize the deceased. They were often taken from scripture, literature, or just simply were short expressions of grief and sorrow. Epitaphs were used to highlight the attributes and accomplishments of the departed. And you can see I listed a few examples from Victorian America. Probably one of the most common, rest in peace or RIP. Gone but not forgotten. At rest. Little lamb asleep in Jesus. The photograph that you see if you haven't figured out by the dates that are listed on it, it's not a real headstone, but actually something from my Halloween decorations. But the reason why I chose it was because of the epitaph that it includes, because I found reference to it in an actual colonial New England epitaph. So the one on the picture that you see reads, as I was, you are now, as I am, you shall be. The one that I found from the New England Cemetery reads, stranger, stop and cast an eye, as you are, so once was I, as I am, you shall be, prepare for death and follow me. So as you can see, there's quite a similarity between the Halloween decoration and an actual epitaph from colonial America. 
So I think someone in the Halloween business did some research when they came up with this particular decorative item. Death shadowed daily life in 19th century America. High mortality rate, poor sanitation, disease, lack of modern science and medicine, and childbirth kept Americans busy with coping with death and mourning. Nothing challenged the Victorian's notion of the good death more than the vast number of deaths caused by the Civil War. In her book, This Republic of Suffering, the historian Drew Gilpin Faust writes, mortality defines the human condition. Death is inescapable and all of us are subject to it. Today, funerals and homecoming services are a celebration of life, but not so for the Victorian Americans. They saw and viewed those types of services as the celebration of death, as it was the culminating event in one's life. So what was going on in 19th century America? Very briefly, those Americans in the 19th century were predominantly Protestant and evangelical. The century was one of great change and reform. Population increased. The size of the country became larger. There was an influx of immigrants and specific migration patterns. There were advances in industry, manufacturing, science, and technology. It was the era of religious revivalism, romanticism, and spiritualism. And it was the era for reform movements, including abolition, temperance, and women's rights. As cities grew in size and population, burial grounds began to overcrowd and fill up. Concerned with public health and sanitation, local governments would begin to look for areas outside of the population centers to establish new areas to bury the dead. In the 1830s, inspired by the garden cemeteries and estates of Europe, Mount Auburn Cemetery opened in Massachusetts as the first garden cemetery in America. Garden and rural cemeteries emerged from this new attitude about death. The idea of public park-like cemeteries spread quickly as they provided the serene environment that mourners found soothing and comforting. These cemeteries featured walking paths, fountains, seating areas, and shade. They typically con contained a variety of trees, shrubs, and florals that were appealing to the senses. The cemeteries were the precursors of community parks and communal recreation areas. Victorian Americans would often picnic at the grave sites of family members. It was during this time that monuments and headstones became grand and ornate, often depicting weeping willows, urns, flowers, and other gentle symbols of love and hope to remind people that death would reunite people with their loved ones. And as you can see from the symbol of the weeping willow in the urn, it is reflected in the logo of the Friends of Mount Hope Cemetery. In 1838, Mount Hope Cemetery in Rochester opened and became America's first municipal Victorian Garden Cemetery. The word cemetery wasn't even used 
commonly until the advent of the garden rural cemetery movement. And the word cemetery itself refers to and translate roughly to sleeping chamber. So let's go inside the gate. Knowing when a particular cemetery opened helps to put the people buried there, the symbols that you find in the funerary art and architecture that you see in the appropriate time frame and context. Entire presentations could be devoted to just discussing the various types of monuments, the differing architectural styles, and statuary on an individual basis. Some of our theme tours at Mount Hope Cemetery does just that. The dead can't speak to us, but their monuments, headstones, and symbols that they left for us to interpret gives us a window into their world. So let's talk about some of that tombstone and headstone imagery. For the most part, cemetery symbolism can fall into one or more of the following four categories. Mortality symbols, nature symbols, worldly symbols, and finally, religious symbols. So let's take a look. We'll start with mortality symbols. Some examples of mortality symbols that you'll encounter in 19th century funerary art include the hourglass, the broken column, the inverted torch, the draped urn, and the broken wheel. One of my favorite symbols to go out and find are the inverted torches. You will most likely never see an inverted torch anywhere but a cemetery. It is a direct and literal reference to death. In this particular example, the torch still has its flame burning. And that's said to represent the eternal flame of the soul that burns in the next realm. But I've also seen examples of inverted torches that don't have any flame at all. And that's to be interpreted simply as the torch was extinguished and the life was extinguished. The broken column. If a particular person was young when they passed away, the broken column can be interpreted as a life cut short. And there are several symbols in the cemetery that make that same reference. When a broken column is draped, as you see here in this particular example, the drape or the cloth represents the earthly garments being shed as the deceased moves from this world to the next. So there are quite a few different examples of broken columns. This one happens to have the drape over the top of it. As we move to the urn, this perhaps is one of the most common 19th century funerary symbols. The body is reduced to ashes or dust, but it was very uncommon in 19th century America for people to be cremated. But as people are reduced in the grave to bones and then dust, the urn was seen as the vessel that would contain those final remnants of that person. The drape, again, represents a mourning accessory. 
And it's that symbolic cloth or veil that serves as the border between earth and heaven. So let's take a look at the headstone of George Grover. From George Grover's headstone, we learn that he died in 1863, and he died aboard the U.S. transport ship Matanzas. His stone tells us that he was 24 years old. However, it doesn't indicate the year that he was born. So I basically did the math. I took 1863, subtracted 24, and figured that he was probably born in 1839. Sometimes you have to take those extra steps and delve into that detective work to extrapolate the information that you're looking for. We know that George Grover served in the Civil War. And if you look closely at the symbols at the top of his headstone, you'll see the cannon, the broken cannon. His regiment is listed on what would be the wooden part of the cannon carriage. As I further researched George Grover, I did discover in fact that he was in an artillery battery. So that would make the presence of the, of the cannon even more precise to his individual story. So let's consider some of the other symbolism. Again, the cannon carriage is broken. The barrel of the cannon is pointed slightly downward and there is a stack of unused ordnance or cannonballs. Note the broken wheel, which is a definite mortality symbol. A broken wheel cannot turn any longer, so it's indicative of the journey of life is now over or cut short. But there's also a wheel that's still intact, representing continuation and eternity. We do, we do know that George Grover died at sea. And his grave is an example of what they call a cenotaph. It is a grave marker that has no remains in the grave itself. His family probably erected the headstone so that they would have a place to visit, to mourn and remember. Since George was a product of Victorian America and he died during the course of the Civil War, George was not afforded the benefit of the good death. He did not die surrounded by family and friends and the family with not having George returned home looked for a way to have closure with his death. Let's take a look at some nature symbols. Nature symbols, as you can see by the listing, is a huge area and it includes so many different things. Everything from flowers to plants to trees, animals, birds, the list goes on. I pulled out a few examples for us to take a look at a little bit closer. We'll start with the lamb. The lamb is one of the most frequently used symbols of Christ in Christian art. Christ is often depicted as a shepherd, but it also, but he is also referred to as the Lamb of God. Lambs also and would often mark the graves of children, particularly infants. It would symbolize their innocence. 
The center photograph shows a sheaf of wheat. And that wheat was a harvestable grain. And it was often meant to represent a person who had lived a long and productive life. It symbolizes not only immortality, but resurrection. Some refer to it as God's harvest. The next example is of ivy. And if you've ever dealt with ivy around your house, I think you'll, you'll understand uh, this one quite well. The hardy vine of ivy is associated with immortality and fidelity. It clings to a support which makes it symbolic of attachment, friendship, and undying love. It is often seen on the headstones of married couples. The ivy itself has a three-pointed leaf, which makes it symbolic of the Trinity. Ivy could not could be carved into a stone or etched into a headstone, but it also was utilized and allowed to grow over headstones in its natural form. And you can see in this particular photograph, this headstone has an actual ivy vine um, climbing all over it. Over time, probably not the best thing for headstones is it makes them quite unreadable and unstable. Let's take a look at the George Huntington Mumford family monument in Mount Hope Cemetery. This happens to be one of my particular favorites. This grand monument stands in the center of the Mumford family plot. And as we inspect it a bit closer, we can see that it's adorned with a Latin cross mounted on three bases. Again, the number three, symbolic of the Trinity. It also has a few floral wreaths upon it, indicative of victory. But what I wanna look at are the four other symbols that you can find on that Mumford monument. The first is the butterfly. The three stages of the butterfly's life, the caterpillar, the chrysalis, and then the butterfly itself are symbols of life, death, and resurrection that pure life cycle. The winged hourglass is a mortality symbol and it has a clear message that time passes rapidly and that every day one comes closer to the time of their death. And I'm sure at one point or another, everyone has used the phrase, time flies. We then see the snake. The snake in itself as a symbol represents death. However, this particular snake appears that it has its tail in its mouth. And in doing so, it creates a cir circular shape or a continuous loop. That being symbolic of representing no beginning and no end of rejuvenation and eternity. This particular symbol was very popular in 19th century funerary symbols and is rarely ever used today. And finally, the bellflowers. The bellflowers, as you can see, are tied together with a ribbon 
symbolic of const constancy, loyalty, and faithfulness. So from all of the various symbols that are represented on the Mumford family monument gives us some insight into their values and their beliefs regarding their thoughts on the afterworld and, and their religion and faith. Worldly symbols. Examples of a worldly symbol can include a book, an anchor, a curtain, a ball, and a lamp. So let's take a closer look at a few examples. I find books on headstones quite fascinating because you find them in different orientations. A closed book, which you can see appears in the photograph that I selected, usually represents a completed life, the last chapter of which ended in the cemetery. Any book can represent the Bible or scripture. And then in contrast, a book that's open is often symbolic and represents the place to record the name of the deceased. The open book is often compared to the human heart as it is open to God's love. The lamp, the lamp comes in a whole host of various forms. Uh, this particular lamp, uh, I found quite interesting. But lamps in general, because of the light that's admitted by it, is a symbol of wisdom, of faithfulness, and piety. So let's take a look at Tabitha's headstone. This is a very interesting slab style headstone, but it has very little information on it. I could make out her name, but the rest of the information was very illegible. I don't have any idea of how old Tabitha may have been when she passed, but what I did find fascinating about her headstone was the symbolism. And you can see the curtain or the veil that appears at the top of the slab monument. That curtain is a symbol of the passage from one world to the next. The curtain is meant to cover and protect. And what is it protecting? It's protecting the deceased. And then look, another open book, which again holds the name of the deceased and symbolic of the open heart. Finally, the category of religious symbols. We could spend an entire presentation just talking about the various religious symbols that you will find in various cemeteries. Again, I chose just a few selections for us to consider. Religious sim symbolism can include crosses, the Star of David, angels in all their forms, the eye and hands, or more precisely, the fingers. So let's take a look at some of these symbols. The first one we see is the headstone of Henry. And you'll see that there is a hand on his particular headstone that has a finger 
that's pointing upward. That particular gesture is symbolic of the soul rising to the heavens. It's very common name is often just communicated as gone home. Many people study angels and they're fascinating. Angels are God's messengers and they travel between earth and heaven. Angels are perhaps one of the most photographed cemetery symbols for, uh, for photographers. There is quite an elaborate hierarchy of angels. And because of our particular time constraints, we can't even begin to delve into um, explaining all of that. But certainly if angels is a topic that interests you, uh, there are several books on the subject and I'm sure you will find a lot of information to help explain the various angels on an individual level. Each angel is different. Each angel represents something quite different. This particular example of the angel appears standing before what's referred to as a table tomb. And again, angels being very symbolic of a person's faith. The Star of David, as you can see, appears on the headstone on this final selection of photos, as well as the Hebrew words for here lies. These symbols are prominent on many Jewish headstones and the Star of David itself, symbolic of divine protection and is the most recognizable of the Jewish symbols. Also take a look at the rocks and the pebbles that appear sitting on the top of this particular headstone. Why are they there? So let's take a look. Here's another example of some headstones that have pebbles and stones on them. The origin of this practice comes from an ancient Jewish tradition of leaving stones on or around a headstone as a way to memorialize and pay respect to the, to the deceased. It was a way to mark a visit to a grave site. Today, if you walk through the cemetery, you'll find many headstones that have rocks, pebbles, stones, bits of glass, coins, and other tokens laying on top or around the headstones as a way for the living to pay respect to the dead. Secret societies, civic groups, social and service clubs, and then fraternal organizations. What's that all about? Many cemetery symbols stem from these secret organizations and clubs that gained prominence in the 19th century. People are social beings and they want to belong. In the years before health and life insurance, benevolent societies were formed to provide members with a social safety net. Many provided protection, companionship, security, medical care, and sometimes a death benefit to the family. Some groups also provided a headstone or burial space in a dedicated plot. 
look closely at tree stone monuments. If you remember the tree stone from a previous slide, look to see if that tree stone has an emblem of the woodsman of the world. If it did, the tree stone was probably a death benefit to one of its members. There is an entire theme tour offered by the Friends of Mount Hope Cemetery that focuses specifically on this particular subject. So you'll have to check that out down the road. Perhaps the most well-known of all of these groups and organization was the Freemasons. The first photograph of the square and the compass is the primary symbol of the Freemasons. Those two instruments were symbolic of the interaction between mind and matter. And then do you see the letter G that appears in between the two tools? Some of our, are of the school that it represents God. Some claim it's geometry. And some say that it is the Greek word genosis or knowledge. The next picture represents the organization known as the Independent Order of Odd Fellows, or IOOF. They're sometimes called the three link fraternity. As you can see, the chain link, the three link of chain with the letters FLT standing for friendship, love, and truth. They were a working class benevolent organization and shared many of the same symbols that the Freemasons used. The three chains, chain link will become their predominant symbol. However, they also used the handshake, as you can see depicted here on the particular headstone, the welcoming handshake into heaven or being guided into heaven. If you look slightly above the handshake in the middle, you can just make out the all seeing eye. I know this example, it's a little harder to see, but it does appear there on that headstone. And then just above that, the words in God we trust. And all of that symbolism fitting within a circular field. Again, the circle or the continuous loop, symbolic of no beginning, no end, and eternity. The third picture is one of my favorites. And I was very excited when I found this as I had been looking for it for quite some time. This emblem is of the Knights of Pythias. Now I'm not gonna get into the history of all of these particular organizations. If there's one of these that interests you, certainly you can do your own research. And again, check out that theme tour that we offer on fraternal organizations. The Knights of Pythias was formed in 1864, so during the American Civil War, and it was a secret society for government clerks. This particular example was quite worn as it appears on a marble headstone. However, you can just make out what looks to be like a knight's helmet and suit of armor. And you can see a falcon perched on top of the helmet, symbolizing vigilance. There's also a long sword and an ax laying crisscrossed across a Bible, signifying faith and respect for law. 
And when the symbol sets within the triangular field, the equilateral triangle, it again represents the Trinity. So as I mentioned, I was quite excited when I stumbled on the emblem for the Knights of Pythias. So let's take a look in a little deeper detail with some Mason, uh, Freemasonry symbolism. And this particular symbolism is of the Scottish Rite Masons. So let's see what we see uh, in this particular example. The double-headed eagle, symbolic of power and respect. Above the eagle's heads, again, the equilateral triangle, representative of the Trinity. The number 32. This particular person was a 32nd degree Mason. So that number reflects their rank or level in the organization. Around the triangle, you see the rays that are coming out from behind it, representative of rays of light in reference to God's presence. The headstone is decorated with oak leaves, directly relating to strength, honor, and virtue. And oak leaves are almost always representative of men. Not only are there oak leaves, but also acorns present, indicating and representing prosperity and the growth of knowledge. The eagle is perched on a branch, and there is a banner that hangs from it with a Latin phrase, spes mea in deo est, translated my hope is in God. A little farther below, the three links of chain with the letters FLT. So as I mentioned, the Masons and the Odd Fellows shared several symbols. And then now, can you see the all seeing eye? The eye of providence representing God. Fraternal organizations are still in existence today, but membership has declined for some over the years. Many of the 19th century groups were segregated by race, religion, gender, and ethnicity. Not to be outdone, there were many splinter groups and auxiliaries that formed from the original groups. So for example, the Freemasons had a women's organization that's referred to as the Order of the Eastern Star. The same goes for the Independent Order of Odd Fellows as their women's group is referred to as the Daughters of Rebecca. The Knights of Pythias also had a women's group and they were called the Pythian Sisters. There was also an African-American group that splintered from the Knights of Pythias. Are these types of groups and organizations still around today? Absolutely. And you're probably familiar with quite a few of them. You may even be a member. Some of which include the Knights of Columbus, the DAR, the Elks Club, the Lions Club, Rotary International, Zanta, VFW, and the American Legion. Cemetery Renaissance 
has led to increased awareness of the historical importance and cultural value of these final resting places. Several have been placed on the National Register of Historic Places, and many of these treasures have friends groups or volunteer groups affiliated with them. These cemeteries now host historic tours and special events such as Victorian picnics, teas, poetry readings, chamber music, and costume reenactments. The majority of garden cemeteries feature rare and exotic plantings that afford them arboretum status. Some are even certified wildlife habitats and sanctuaries. The last quarter of the 20th century brought even more changes to cemeteries and symbolism. The style of garden rural cemeteries gave way to lawn parks and memorial parks. Cremation rose in popularity and acceptance as an, as an alternative to in-ground burials. With lawn parks, this design saw a unified, uniform sized monument in carefully spaced rows, as well as open lawn areas for flat markers. Large mausoleum buildings were construct constructed and columbariums were in use for cremains. Memorial parks, their design opts for the use of flat markers only so that there are no headstones or monuments to obstruct a person's view. They try to achieve the flowing beauty of nature in a more egalitarian approach. But they would also have ample space for mausoleum buildings. Some cemeteries also offer the availability of scatter gardens and green burial options. If I'm not mistaken, the only Memorial Park Cemetery in our area is that of Whitehaven located in Pittsburgh. In general, headstones and monuments have become smaller. The symbolism has also become more literal in interpretation. Because of its durability, granite remains the most popular stone material utilized for headstones. However, there has been a return to the use of natural stones or boulders, if you will, and the advent of stainless steel. And you can see a couple of examples of stainless steel crosses that I came about um, in some cemeteries I recently visited. Sandblasting, power tools, and laser cutting devices turn headstones into canvases for artwork. Religious and traditional symbols remain important choices for people. Typically, we strive to commemorate a person's life and that is reflected in the contemporary art that can be found on today's headstones. You'll find images of a person's occupation, perhaps professional credentials, their hobbies, their pets, toys, and whatever else the deceased held special in life. Even lifelike images of a person can be laser etched into a stone. It is not unusual to find sports logos, superheroes, and animals on headstones. Epitaphs remain as important to people as ever, and some even express the sense of humor that the deceased had. 
One of my personal favorites can be found in Mount Hope Cemetery. And that particular stone belongs to Mr. and Mrs. McGowan. And if you read the reverse of their headstone, it simply says, enjoy. When you're dead, you're dead a long time. People visit cemeteries for a whole host of reasons. To visit graves, to mourn and remember, to commune with nature, to admire art and architecture, to take photographs, for quiet time, meditation and reflection, for exercise and fresh air, to explore history or go on a tour, and to find unique baby names, as I was told by some expectant parents recently. I hope that I've piqued your interest in cemetery symbolism and inspired you to go out on your own investigations. If you're in a cemetery and you see something interesting, give it a second look. It just might be an example of cemetery symbolism. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Brandon and the Rochester Public Library for hosting this presentation and be sure to check out the Friends of Mount Hope Cemetery. You can find us online at fomh.org and on Facebook. Thank you very much for your attendance to this presentation today. Well, thank you, Deb, for speaking for us. It was a wonderful and very enlightening presentation. I learned a tremendous amount. We've had a couple of questions come in in the chat to get things started. Um, both of them had to do with the odd fellows, and I believe you at least partially answered them. The first one was asking about, uh, back in, I believe, your third slide, if there was an odd fellows logo on one of the headstones. Um, and that matches the logo you showed later on in your slide on fraternal organizations. But we had another question come in asking about the current status of the Odd Fellows in Rochester, as there is the Odd Fellows Hall on Gregory Street. Um, I did respond that I believe they're still in operation, but do you happen to know any more about their presence in Rochester? As I mentioned, a, a lot of the organizations uh, still operate. Uh, I'm not familiar with any of the local uh, chapters that may exist. Uh, the most honest answer to that particular question is to, uh, you know, really take a, a delve into that and see what you might be able to find out. Very fair answer. We have a couple more questions that have come in. Uh, first off, uh, Carol Klinger, I see your hand is raised. You wouldn't mind unmuting and asking your question. Carol, do you hear me? Well, we'll come back to you. Uh, we have a couple more questions in chat. Uh, first one, what was the definition of a memorial park again? I'm sorry, memorial oh. park? Uh, yeah, what was the definition of a memorial park? Um, the, the evolution of the style of cemetery, um, memorial parks kind of incorporate um, some of the stylistic elements of lawn park cemeteries as they uh, utilize flat headstones. But the ultimate goal for, as I understand it, for memorial parks is they wanted to, um, to not utilize upright headstones that often impede people's view of sight. So by oh. having the headstones flush to the ground. That's how it started. Okay. okay. I, 
I wasn't sure if someone was interjecting. That's why I paused. I paused don't believe because I just said out loud, my Lord, is that how they started? <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> so, so as I was saying, as I understand it, uh, they wanted to uh, have headstones flush to the ground so that there wasn't that obstruction in the line of sight. And it was also a very uh, uh, egalitarian approach to death. So meaning that um, headstones, flat headstones were very uniform in a sense. It wasn't uh, a matter of what money could purchase. Stones were fairly similar in size and shape and form. Thank you. I thought, Deb, years ago was that they could mow easier. <laughs> yeah, that's that's also another uh, uh, another uh, facet of it. It it certainly uh, uh, revolves around maintenance and and lawn care and things of that groundskeeping. Yeah. Yep, definitely right. I have a couple more questions from chat. Uh, this first one's from Amanda Dudley. Is the tree stump similar to the broken column symbol? Yes, it, it can be very similar uh, to the broken column as far as uh, symbolism, especially if uh, the individual that, that passed away was young. Oftentimes on the tree stumps, you'll see um, the branches uh, cut off or broken off. They would appear in that way. Tree stump or tree stone monuments are quite interesting and they're actually more uh, prevalent in the Midwest than they are in the eastern uh, half of the country. Uh, as the Woodsman of the World organization I believe started in Iowa and because they utilized that particular stone uh, motif as their death benefit for members, um, there's many more of them that are found uh, in the Midwest. But yes, tree stump uh, can be indicative of a life cut short just as a broken column. And just as a reminder that so many symbols can have multiple meanings. Absolutely. Uh, before we move on to additional questions, we actually have a comment here I do want to read for everyone. Uh, this is from Cynthia Hauk who, for those of you who don't know, is the historian for the Landmark Society. Um, there's also a former Odd Fellows Hall built in the 1920s on Stutson Street in Charlotte, now converted to apartments and an event center next to Hose 39 Restaurant. Uh, at its peak, the many lodges of Rochester's Odd Fellows were headquartered from the 1880s to 1947 in a magnificent six-story Second Empire-style building on North Clinton Avenue, corner of Division Street, uh, it looks like a clone of the Powers building. A.J. Warner was the architect for both. The Odd Fellows sold that building and it was demolished in 1947 for the current two-story retail building, the former Neisner's that's there, now vacant. Uh, back on to questions. Um, the next question in line is from Connie and Ron Robinson. Uh, they're asking what is Zonta, Z-O-N-T-A. It was mentioned briefly. Uh Zonta is an organization, a women's organization that um, is an international group that um, serves, serves the uh, and strives to gain empowerment and equality uh, for women uh, across the world. Okay. Uh, we have a hand raised by Reverend James Swartz. Mr. Swartz, would you like to uh, join us with your question? I forgot my microphone. Uh, <laughs> very interesting, Deb. You mentioned the uh, one stone, uh, the Civil War stone, that the person wasn't there. And I thought you'd be interested in, a, in an absolutely beautiful uh, um, zinc monument I found down in uh, Sparta, uh, which has all of the elements, the raised hand, uh, the raised person at the top, but one of the four panels on it, 
actually reads, uh, uh, Jacob Dieter died in the Richmond Hospital, Virginia, March 29th, 1864, age 35. Father far away is sleeping with some soldier friends who are dead. He is in the Savior's keeping, but we cannot find his bed. Yes, in heaven, his soul is lying, but it makes him seem more near. If this token to him given makes believing that he is here. It's an abs absolutely, uh, that's the, the one panel of that inscription on that enormous zinc monument. So it's just another example of what you were talking about. Uh, memorials that are not uh, the person who is actually there. And uh, I'm glad you brought that, that up because that was, a, uh, 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 I think, a very important part of what we visit in our cemeteries and memorialize those whose bodies were never recovered or returned. And I, I've, said, I've seen a couple others in Mount Hope of uh, uh, lost soldiers and so forth. Uh, memorialized only one or two at Mount Hope, but I've seen them all there also. So I, that was a comment. I appreciate your letting me make that comment. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And that was a, a, a wonderful example uh, of a beautiful epitaph. And uh, one of my side projects is I not only go on symbol hunts, if you will, but I also go looking and recording um, various epitaphs that I find. So the one that you just read from the example, um, I believe you mentioned from Sparta, um, is, is quite beautiful and uh, certainly indicative of the period of time that we were focusing on. So thank you for that. Our next question is from Neil, uh, excuse me, or Jashik or Jashik. My, my apologies. Uh, the headstones that have razor, excuse me, laser etched photos, how permanent are they? One of the, uh, one of the examples uh, that I showed um, that uh, depicted um, a young man in a Navy uniform uh, and his uh, life, likeness was etched on using uh, that particular technology into his flat style headstone. Um, I haven't read or seen where um, those particular etchings don't stand the test of time. Um, I think those are, um, those are newer uh, choices that people are making um, when it comes to uh, cemetery symbolisms. So it will be interesting um, to see uh, down the road um, how those particular uh, photographic style etchings hold up over time. Given the, uh, the technology and the tools and the preciseness of those uh, uh, lasers that are utilized to to create that, that type of art, um, I would imagine that uh, they should be pretty durable. Um, otherwise, I'm, I'm sure they wouldn't be able to charge the amount of money that they do um, for that particular, um, that particular style. So I, I hope that answers your question. I'm not, uh, they're, they're pretty new in cemeteries. You do see them more and more every day. So it will be interesting to see exactly how those hold up. Yeah, they, um, they seem to be very prevalent uh, in, uh, in Russian Soviet cemeteries mm. and, uh, mm. among uh, Russian immigrant communities here. So I, there might be a somewhat longer history there, but uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have is from Toyer. Does FOMH or DEB have published resources to further study cemetery symbols and iconography? 
thank you for your question. I would hope uh, that anyone that's interested in this particular topic of cemetery symbolism, um, do a standard Google search. You'll get an entire listing of uh, various books and apps and websites that will help you in your quest. Um, one of the valuable tools that I use um, is find a grave and billion graves. Um, but there are some really wonderful um, books on cemetery symbolisms that have been published in recent years that serve as field guides to help uh, to give various definitions um, on, on individual symbols. I would love one day for me to take um, all of the research that I've done and photographs uh, that I've taken and incorporate that into uh, a published piece of work, but we'll just have to how, have to see how that all goes. But thank you very much for your question. Our next question is from Sandy. What is the meaning of the table monuments? Oh, Sandy, that's a great question. So if you recall from the photograph, of the angel standing at what they called a table tomb. Uh, that particular photograph was taken in uh, Holy Sepulchre Cemetery in Rochester. And as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, Victorian Americans would often utilize cemetery space for, uh, as a park and for recreational outings and would often picnic in cemeteries. And it would not be unheard of that people would travel to the cemetery with their picnic baskets or bags. And if your particular loved one that had such a um, tomb, uh, tomb in the style of a table, it wouldn't be unheard of that that tabletop be utilized as a, a table um, to present food to, um, to the people that were there visiting their relative. So oh, there's interesting. Yeah, that's there's a lot of different variations um, of, of table tombs. Some sit much lower to the ground so that if someone was sitting on the ground, the table would be lower. The one from Holy Sepulchre is, is stands a bit taller. So I'm not sure of that particular example is, um, uh, would have been utilized in that capacity, but uh, a lot of table tombs were, uh, were used in that manner by family. So we have a question here. Okay, it was cut off partially. Are there some zinc or Sears catalog monuments at Mount Hope? Yes, there are zinc monuments at Mount Hope. And, and thank you for your question. And again, we have an entire theme tour uh, in our repertoire um, that deals specifically with the various um, plots in Mount Hope Cemetery that contain zinc monuments. Um, so there are several and uh, zinc monuments were, were popular um, in the, uh, the later half of the 19th century and were in existence into the early part of the 20th century. So um, I won't get into the whole history of zinc monuments, but um, I think they're one of the most beautiful um, uh, headstones that you can encounter in a cemetery. And a lot of, uh, back in the day, a lot of people frowned on them because they didn't think they would stand, stand the test of time. But uh, lo and behold, many of them are still standing and are in good condition. So thank you for that question. Yeah, 
that is that is the last question we've had come in. Are there any other questions anyone would like to ask? All right. I can't get it to go to everyone. Sure. Go ahead and ask your question. Um, a question that I had was, I would love to find that uh, table monument with the angel at Holy Sepulcher. Uh, sure. Could you tell General what section of Holy Sep it's in? Uh, thank you for your question. <laughs> Um, I am, I'm trying to remember, just bear with me a second. Um, it is in the older section of this, of Holy Sepulchre. So if you are facing north in your car, as if you were driving down Lake Avenue, driving north, it would be this, the half of the cemetery that would be on your right hand side. And as you pull in, you'll approach the chapel and the table monument is fairly close to the main chapel off to the right as you were driving in the gate. Thank you, that's gonna be very- You're, you're welcome. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't do any better than that. Thanks, that makes it easy. Terrific. Any other questions? Deb, if you, um, if we have any more, any other questions that come to mind later, do you have uh, perhaps an email address that we can contact you at? The easiest way uh, perhaps to send your question that would make it to me is if you go on our website, fomh.org and utilize the contact us page. You can type your question there and then it will make its way to me. Okay, thank you. You're very Deb. welcome, thank you. Deb, this is Cynthia Hout, can you hear me? Yes, Cynthia. I, I can't get my chats to go to everybody. They only seem to wanna to go to the host. I just wanna make a, co a comment about um, ac the accuracy of epitaphs, um, as I discovered when I was researching my great great uncle, whose cenotaph is in Oakwood Cemetery, Penfield, and his widow had inscribed on the cenotaph not only his name, his date of death, but how he, where he died. And she states that he was killed in the Battle of the Wilderness, which is just west of Fredericksburg, Virginia. And he she had the date of the de of death, a correct date of death. When I went to research this, it was actually at the National Park Battlefields. The wonderful staff person there said, your uncle, great, great uncle did not die in the battle of the wilderness. I said, what do you mean it's on his headstone? She had the official federal records. Oh, he died on a specific date, but he had survived the battle of the wilderness. He actually died in the battle of Spotsylvania courthouse several days later. So for you folks that are researching, your family members do not take things inscribed in stone like a headstone as absolute truth. You have to do a little more research to confirm that information. Absolutely. Thank you, Cynthia, for that comment. Uh, that is entirely true. When you're doing uh, research uh, in that manner, you want to make sure that you check and double check and triple check. And even though it, it may be carved into the stone, it's not necessarily set in stone. So thank you. I do appreciate that comment. Do we have any other questions? We have time for one more. See, Reverend Swartz has his hand up again. Uh, 
I'm sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. Yeah, the last question was very good, and your response was excellent. When I used to teach uh, uh, introductory genealogy at Brighton uh, <clears throat> and a couple other places, I had a young student whose grandmother was buried in Holy Sepulchre, and they had trouble uh, reconciling her date of birth and date of death because she had prepared her tombstone ahead of time. And when he went back and researched, what he found was every census, she cut one year off of her birth. So her, her tombstone was actually like, ten, she was like 10 years younger on her tombstone than she actually was. It was really hilarious, or about eight years, because she died sometime in her 80 or 80s or 90s. But he did a lot of research to come up with this. And he brought in a picture of a stone and his records to show don't believe everything that's on the tombstone. <laughs> so the question and your response was excellent. Thanks for that one. Thank you very much, Mr. Swartz, for your comment. One of the one of the most important things that I learned very early on um, regarding genealogy research is always uh, document at least from from at least two different sources um, to verify whether something is true or not. At the very least, you, you need to get the same information from two different sources and, and hopefully they are not just memory-based sources. Absolutely, that's absolutely true. And thank you so much for that comment. Just another uh, example of things not being set in stone in reference to Holy Sepulchre Cemetery. Our Civil War hero, uh, Patrick Henry O'Rourke is uh, buried there. And Colonel O'Rourke died in the Battle of Gettysburg. But the date of his death on his headstone is wrong. He actually died on July the 2nd, but his headstone says that he died on July the 3rd, 1863. So again, making sure that uh, you check, double check, and then triple check all of your sources is a very important fact. And, um, and uh, I think that's been communicated extremely well with those uh, those participating in the uh, in the Q and A session, well, folks, the time is noon. Our presentation has ended for the day. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope to see you back in January for our next session of Morning in the Morning. Have a good day. <laughs>